listening to the NFL Draft Bible Podcast Network, part of Sports Illustrated, giving you daily NFL Draft, Dynasty, and Debbie Fantasy Football Podcasts. Class is in session. The Debbie Seminar is back. We took a little bit of a sabbatical there, gentlemen, as I was out for wedding-related activities. We had to get back into the, the rhythm of things last week, so we just had the blitz. But this week, we are back and added here with the Debbie Seminar Week 8 News and Notes, Risers and Fallers, and then a Slate Preview of what our Devi fans can be looking out for here in week eight of the college football season. My name is Matt Hicks, the FF educator, joined as always by John Lobb, the Great Iron Scholar, and Skip Newton. Gentlemen, you ready to talk some Devi? Absolutely. I can't wait. There's, it's been a great year, and our Devi rankings have changed so much in the first seven weeks. Yeah, it's it's been a crazy year. So really glad to have have the the show back, and it's good to have you back, Matt. So let's uh, let's get started, man. All right, let's go ahead. Some news and notes. Uh, so our news and notes themselves are just from this week. Uh, when we talk risers and fallers, we're going to be talking a little bit more general uh, for all the weeks we've missed. But certainly, we're not trying to recap all of the news, gentlemen, from the last four weeks. <laughs> that would be a tall task in and of itself. Uh, but Penn State verbal commit quarterback Drew Alar has been elevated to a five-star prospect, according to 247 Sports. Uh, so there's a little bit of hope on the horizon for Penn State. Georgia freshman wide receiver slash tight end Eric Gilbert. Uh, we were given an update on him this week by Kirby Smart, and the update is that there is no update. He is still away <laughs> from team activities, uh, but he is still considered a member of the Georgia program. Former Syracuse wide receiver Taj Hall has received a good amount of interest here, uh, interest from Mississippi State. Uh, and on Tuesday, he was offered a, a scholarship from Auburn. Auburn, uh, Taj Harris paired up with uh, Bo Nix, who's coming off of a big week. That's pretty interesting. Taj Harris was certainly a player that was on the general radar going into this season. So it would be interesting to see where he lands, especially if he ends up in the SEC. Missouri, the Tigers, Mizzou, they land a five-star wide receiver, Luther Burden. Uh, Burden was formerly committed to Oklahoma. I know the Tigers are excited about Connor Baselick. Maybe they could pair him up with Burden and uh, spark a little bit of juice here in this otherwise not so exciting Mizzou offense. Uh, Miami had a pair of senior wide receivers, D. Higgins and Mark Pope, enter the transfer portal. So they'll be looking to be a spark uh, for a new team in 2022. Wiggins and Pope, neither one of them were atop of the Devi radar, but they were definitely on my Devi watch list going into this season. It'll be interesting to see where these two end up. And then Miami freshman here, sticking with the Hurricanes quarterback, Jake Garcia. He's still recovering from ankle surgery. It's really a shame here because we want to see Garcia on the field with De'Ara King out. But Miami has suggested that we still may see Jake Garcia at some point this season. And I'm hoping we capitalize on that window because I could see Jake Garcia being a big riser here in the offseason on the Devi landscape. Gentlemen, from news and notes, any omissions, any additions? I just am wondering if um, Luther Burden can play defense because Missouri <laughs> needs someone to stop the run. <laughs> maybe, maybe I would, maybe I would be some, recruiting some big boys. But what do I know? I, I don't, I don't like, I don't mind that at all. Right? I mean, go to a team that doesn't play defense. That just means more, <laughs> more <laughs> reason to pass right. the ball. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I'm with you, Matt. I, I really want to see Jake Garcia out there. Uh, I like the the film on him coming out of high school. So hopefully he can get get his health and get out on the field at least some point this season since things aren't going so well for Miami. 
Yeah, I mean, I tried to I tried to trade uh, Jake Garcia to skip this past week. That didn't work, so I don't know. I guess he might not want him too bad. No, I'm just kidding, skip. <laughs> All right, uh, gentlemen, let's go ahead and let's jump into our risers and fallers. Uh, so for this segment, we did try to break it up here uh, into thinking about risers and fallers on the grand scheme here, kind of what we've missed over the last few weeks. And I did limit it for the guys because if I left it open-ended, uh, we'd probably each have about 50 risers and 50 fallers. Uh, I know, you know, certainly my Devi ranks and, and, you know, it's, it's available to anyone who's a patron of mine. Uh, you can see my Devi ranks, they are growing. I, I only rank my top 150 and then I just add other guys on the watch list. I've added about 50 since the season started because new guys have popped up. But my goodness, guys, the top 10, the top 50, they shuffle every week. And I'm not somebody who likes doing a ton of shuffling of Debbie ranks. I like to be slow and steady. But with this season, I have no option. And I want to start here talking about Texas true freshman wide receiver Xavier Worthy. He is leading the Longhorns in receptions 29, 542 yards, leading the team in receptions, 18.7 yards per reception, and he's leading the team in touchdowns. And it's not just the stat book, gentlemen. He's passing the eye test. He is fast. He is athletic. He's already proving to be a good route runner, creating natural separation. I was not ready to buy into Xavier Worthy preseason because we hear this narrative every year. Uh, Texas has got their wide receiver. Texas has got their wide receiver. And it never seems to come to fruition but Xavier Worthy, he wasted no time becoming an impact player here on the Longhorns offense. And then the other guy is not somebody new to the scene, but somebody who I had been banging the drum for this offseason. I've got him nearly everywhere, gentlemen, almost every roster. There was a Debbie auction this offseason. I got him for $2. It is running back Jerome Ford out of Cincinnati. 102 yards, 709 yards, 12 touchdowns. Gentlemen, the Bearcats have played six games. Jerome Ford has 12 touchdowns, including four last week. Ford is a powerful runner in between the tackles. He's got good breakaway speed. He's got NFL size. And don't be confused by the fact he's playing at Cincinnati. Originally an Alabama recruit, a four-star guy out of college. To me, Jerome Ford... Uh, barring some horrible athletic testing, I think he's locked into being a day two running back here in the 2022 NFL draft. I am so excited to see what he does here at the NFL level. Skip, any thoughts on those guys or do you want to jump right to your guys? You know, Xavier Worthy is an absolute stud. I think you nailed it there. I mean, you put him out there before we could, but yeah, he of all the of all the freshman wide receivers, he he is the guy that has just absolutely looked the best. And I'm so glad you put Jerome Ford uh, on this list because he is he is one of my biggest risers as well. I'll admit, I was not nearly as high on him before the season like you were. So you know, watching him play now, and I'm I was actually watching a little bit of him today. It's like, man, this 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 kid can play. And I, I think you're right. I think he's he's probably locked himself into a day two pick, and to to, you know, add on to that, you know, speaking of day two picks, I'm going to go into my first guy and then I'll let John kind of jump in is Michigan state running back Kenneth Walker, the third. I mean, he looks fantastic at Michigan state. He's only three yards shy of a thousand already nine touchdowns this season. Interesting last year, he didn't have the gaudy numbers for the yardage, but still scored 13 touchdowns. So the guy knows how to get in the end zone. I really love Kenneth Walker, the third before I get to my last guy, John, any thoughts on any of these three guys? I'm big on to Jerome Ford now. He's obviously pumped up. Everyone knows I love the American Athletic Conference, so I watch a lot of Cincinnati football. I predicted that they would be the first group of five team to ever make the playoffs back in August when I made a, an appearance on the Campus to Canton podcast with Austin and, um, oh, I forgot Austin's partner now, Colin. Colin, yep. Colin, I said Cincinnati would make the playoffs. So I like him a ton. I'm huge on Worthy. I mean, I didn't expect this big, this quick. I mean, unbelievable. And yes, I've been overly impressed with Kenneth Walker. Hey, systems matter. Opportunity matters. Walker's in a better system for his skill set. The team is hot. 
it's a lot of things have changed and it all worked for the benefit of Kenneth Walker. A real quick yeah, on absolutely. Kenneth Walker. Remember when he transferred from Wake Forest to Michigan State? And we all kind of tilted our head to the side a little bit. We said, yeah. you know, he had a good spot in Wake Forest. He was going to have to split at Michigan State. I mean, him and Mel Tucker knew what they were doing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great move. And then my next guy, and again, this is my personal riser. It's USC wide receiver Drake London. I think a lot of other people were higher on him than I was. <laughs> I, Matt knows I, I love Jake London. Yeah, I couldn't get past the <laughs> – and it's still my only concern is the separation piece, but mm -hmm. the dude just flat out makes plays. I mean, he, <laughs> he catches everything they throw at him. He's a huge target, he, and he's a, he's a target hog. I mean, the, the stats don't lie. I think he's all but locked himself into a day one pick uh, unless he tests horribly. I, I just – He's up there in that tier one. You know, I, I'm not saying he's my wide receiver one. He's not, but I think he's he's a guy pressing for for late first round. So really like uh, Drake London. And he's a huge riser for me. Matt, you uh, looked like you were going to argue. I struggle with Drake London. I was somebody <laughs> I had Drake London high uh, going into this off season. He was a priority film review for me. And skip, it was that separation. Uh, and, and so I, I've liked what he's done this season. I'm still worried. Uh, it's it's something that I have refused to look past. Uh, and, and it's gotten me on the negative side of a lot of prospects before. Uh, folks really like them, and I end up not liking them as much. It comes down to separation. It's difficult for me to uh, give anybody a day one grade if they don't consistently separate I'm also, you know, really curious if there's an NFL team that might view Drake London as more of a tight end. You know, he primarily uh, runs routes over the middle of the field, a little bit shorter routes. So I'm not taking anything away from Drake London. He's having a great season. But the NFL translation, I'm just, I'm not there yet. I'm not ruling it out. I'm just, I'm not there yet. <laughs> All right. All right. That's fair. That's fair. Of course, you didn't like my guy, Rashad Bateman, so we'll see how that plays out. Well, again, Skip, <laughs> I like guys that can separate on their own, so. <laughs> I, I'll just say before I go on to mine, I've liked Drake London for a long time. Yeah, and I was on him first. Matt, I totally understand what Matt says, because if you watch the film, the separation is not there. However, he's big, he's nasty, he's productive. The NFL's going to like him a lot. I mean, the dude is getting peppered with 18 or 19 targets a week, catching 12 to 13 passes. He's 6'5". Now, ultimately, Skip, I still have a second-round grade. That's, But I'm a tough grader. But I do think athleticism is going to matter. Does he do what Cortland Sutton did? When Cortland Sutton went to that combine, boom. He, you know, he locked it in. He was an uber athlete. I think Drake London's a great athlete, but we're going to find out at the combine. To me, that's that's the only thing I need to see right now. Yeah, if, if he too. does, if he does some athletic, unbelievable for his you know size and weight, all of a sudden he's a first round pick. If he's just very good, I think the film and the you know that'll be a second round. That's what I have right now. But man, he's unbelievable. Yeah, but that's fair. We're all looking for quarterbacks. I mean. We have taken tumbles. No, I think there's not a consensus. I've seen people with Malik Willis number one. To me, he's definitely not number one. You know, well, I've seen Matt Corral. I've seen Sam Howell. I still still have my guy Sam Howell right now because of the body of work over two and a half years. But in my book right now, the fastest riser this year is by far Kenny Pickett. First of all, I cannot wait. If you don't have your popcorn, if you are not sitting down at 3 of 30 or you don't have a DVR, you don't like scouting quarterbacks. Because Kenny Pickett, his draft stock is right here, right now, against the Tigers. I know Clemson isn't playing well this year, but their defense is still legitimate. That is a legitimate defense. They just literally can't score. They cannot score 20 points, Clemson. But the defense is legit. Pittsburgh and Kenny Pickett are playing Clemson at home. 
This game, to me, is going to dictate a lot. Pickett's beat Tennessee. That game even looks more, a little bit more impressive, impressive right now. He beat Georgia Tech with Jeff Sims. He's He went into Virginia Tech last week and beat down the Hokies. That is not an easy spot to play. These are young men in college. You go to Blacksburg and you beat Virginia Tech right here. I believe that Kenny Pickett and Pitt and Pittsburgh are going to win this game. But I got my popcorn. No one's bothering me. I am watching Kenny Pickett because I've got to scout him against the Tigers. If you can't be home, get your DVR ready, folks, because this is a big, big game for this young man. And the numbers are outrageous. Matt has heard me talk about this. He's probably bored with it. Touchdown to interception ratio, 21 to 1. I love that. Smart and intelligent with the football. This is great. He's throwing the ball 9.4 yards per attempt. He's throwing the ball down the field, and he's increased his passer rating this year to 181. Pickett is a legitimate second-round pick right now. This game at Clemson is going to decide a lot. He reminds me he's in that Derek Carr, Andy Dalton bucket of prospects. He's going to get draft discussion. We'll see how high he can rise. My number, I don't understand. Debbie is late to this one. I don't know why this young man's gone over the radar. He had a good freshman year. Maybe it's because he's up in Syracuse. If you have not watched Sean Tucker, he's a legitimate NFL back. Matt was talking about Garrett Schrader on our Blitz show. Go watch that. And I so bad wanted to talk about Sean Tucker. But I was like, I'll keep it to this show right now. Sean Tucker has size, vision, breakaway speed. He can catch the ball. He has a lot of the skills that you are looking for. 5'10", 210 pounds. A legitimate pass catcher. He's in a dominant game. He's a little bit of an upright runner. But I love his skills. He has underrated wiggle. Sean Tucker is a freshman. You get the extra year. We understand. I think he's going to be the class of 2023. That's what I would advise the young man to come out. He's averaging this year. I want to make sure I get it right. 6.1 yards a carry with 16 touchdowns. Skip was talking about finding the end zone. Sean Tucker finds, I'm sorry, 11 touchdowns, 14 receptions. I threw that up. Sean Tucker finds the end zone. And one player that I know the NFL is going to like more than the Debbie community and the entire Twitterverse, ladies and gentlemen, they're going to love Jamison Williams of Alabama. I'm just telling you right now. I don't care what the production model says. I don't care what the breakout age says. Alabama, Ohio State. He couldn't get on the field. Come on, they had two guys, one named Garrett Wilson and another player named Chris Olave. Where was the young man going to get on the field? He transfers to Alabama, and he's their best playmaker. Jamison Williams is the best Alabama wide receiver. He's playing better football than John Mechie, the NFL. Now, if he goes to the combine and runs like a 4-3-8 or lower, which it looks like on film, he has elite speed. The NFL is going to like him. Alabama pedigree, deep speed. He has a role in the NFL. Jamison Williams has, to me, moved up at least to a second-day pick. I don't know if he's a second- or third-round pick. Want to see the raw athletic skills, but the NFL is going to love Jamison Williams. I do, too. I think he's a legitimate playmaker. All right, gentlemen. Well, when there's risers, there are fallers. (laughs) And my goodness, what is going on with DJU? I mean, I guess this was the low-hanging fruit here Uh, The question, I think, is how far does DJU fall? For a lot of folks, he was the number one Debbie guy going into this season. Uh, You know, there was general consensus out there in the Debbie world that it was worth prioritizing the 2023 quarterback class. Uh, And 
for most folks, because we got to see some really good flashes of TJU last year, there was general confidence that we could put him atop Bryce Young. I think right now when you look at the 23 class, Bryce Young is absolutely ahead of DJU. Gentlemen, uh, he's fallen to sixth in my Devi ranks. Uh, and, you know, it almost feels like I'm doing him a favor, still keeping him up there at six. He's looked out of sync. He looks like he doesn't understand the field. Now I'm keeping him up there because he's got the pedigree. I know he has the talent in him. We saw it last year. Clemson has a lot going on here. Offensive line issues. The wide receivers have not helped him out, uh, but certainly a lot of this is on him as well. I will say what's going in his favor is that Dabo Sweeney still uh, at least is perceived to have a kind of steady confidence in DJU. I don't know if he has another option because there's certainly nobody challenging DJU right now. Uh, maybe we see a transfer come in in the offseason to push him in camp, um, but – you know, right now, DJU is a free faller because it seemed like he was such an exciting guy. We were ready to just plug him in as the next, you know, automatic quarterback, the Justin Fields, the Trevor Lawrence that we could lock him in and be ready for. Uh, we're not proceeding with that level of confidence. And speaking of, of uh, loss of confidence, former Wisconsin running back Jalen Berger, who was a top 50, top 75 guy, uh, was in the Wisconsin system. A lot of people wanted him to take on that Jonathan Taylor role. He had the size. He had the recruiting pedigree. I certainly was excited for him. He's not even on, he's not even on the team anymore. So we're going to keep an eye on Jalen Berger. You're not getting rid of your Berger shares because, you know, he will land with another program. I'm guessing it's going to be a smaller Power 5 program. Uh, and, and, you know, the details have not come out. Maybe it wasn't a fit with the coaching staff. Maybe Berger needed a change of scenario. That happens with these young kids sometimes. Uh, so there's certainly, you know, the door's not closed on Jalen Berger, but, you know, he's off of my top 150. He's in the watch list right now. Yeah, I, I can't argue with that at all. I, I wasn't really even that high on Berger to begin with, but, yeah, he something's going on there. And DJ Wayong Galele, that's – that is from out of nowhere. And it's, it's not a, it's not even something that you can, you can say, all right, he, he's had like one or two really good games and then a few bad ones. It's been consistently just, he, he's not getting it done. And it's, it's really bizarre after he looked so good in those two games, you know, plus he played last year. So yeah, I so confused about that one. My quarterback isn't, nearly the free fall that, that DJU is, but it's Oklahoma quarterback, Spencer Rattler. Hey, DJU's he, got his job. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, <laughs> the, the, yeah, good point. You know, the, the thing with Rattler is this is now the second season in a row where he's been benched, except this time he's not getting his job back because Caleb Williams looks awesome and that ship has sailed. So what happens next for Spencer Rattler? We don't know. Does he go pro anyway? Does he transfer to another school to try and, kind of earn back the, the scouts trust and, and showcase what he can do because the talent is there. There's just something not right with, I don't know if it's his attitude, if he's a head case, you know, something's going on because he just makes too many mistakes and, and isn't, he doesn't strike me as the, the leader that, that an NFL team will want. So I have a lot of concerns about Spencer Rattler. I mean, he was a lot of people's number one quarterback going you know, 2022 draft class. And now who knows, right? And if if you have him on your Debbie roster, if, if you can get good value for him, then then great, go ahead and trade him. But if you can't, you, you're probably best, you know, just holding on and, and hoping at this point. And then the next guy, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think, you know, Spencer Rattler, I, he's got to be a stronghold. I, I would not move him unless you're getting pre-benching prices, which I don't think you're getting. Uh, you know, it's the tools are there, right? And so I've always had reservations with Spencer Rattler's mental processing. And that's always been an issue for me, that decision-making. But the NFL drafts tools. We know that at the end of the day, right? Jordan Love, first-round pick. Uh, Daniel Jones, top 10 pick. The NFL's going to uh, draft tools. And Spencer Rattler has those tools. I fully expect him to transfer. There's plenty of schools that will take him as a starter next year. Uh, you know, it's going to be Jalen Hurts-esque. You know, the excuse will be, well, you know, it was Caleb Williams. It's the next phenom. And I think Spencer Rattler will still end up being a first-round pick in 2023. 
And so the Devi discount for me is that you have to wait another year. It's a reclassification. I'm trying to treat it similar to an injury. Um, but I will tell you, Spencer Rattler's down to 15 of my Devi ranks. Caleb Williams, he's at 14. I, I, you know, he lost his starting job and he got leapfrogged in the Devi ranks. Yes, I also have Caleb Williams ahead of, of Rattler as well. And my other guy, and I don't know, maybe I was just too high on him, but Oregon wide receiver Devin Williams, I I loved this guy. I grabbed him in a ton of leagues, and it it's just like he's not even on the team. It's so weird. <laughs> he barely gets any action. I, I actually got super excited last week because he, he got a couple of catches like, hey, he's alive. <laughs> and so I I don't know you know what to do at this point. I mean, I've heard you know, comps like coaches, you know, there was a quote, he, he was comp to, to Godwin from Tampa Bay. And I'm like, well, I like that. And, yeah. and when you, you, I love the physical attributes. I mean, he, he's this, you know, big target, he's athletic. So I, I'm encouraged, I was encouraged by all that, but man, you're just, you're just seeing nothing on the field. And that's, that's really disheartening. And at this point I can't keep him as highly ranked as I had him. So he's one of my fallers. You know, I think I'm hoping against hope for Oregon wide receivers because you can pick your Oregon wide receiver, your talented <laughs> guy that you want. You know, there, it, it's it's a talented room. I'm hoping that when it when it comes to next year, that it's Ty Thompson's job and he's able to unlock the offense. But I think you know we keep buying into and Skip. You're not the only one. I'm right there with you. We keep buying into this idea that the Oregon offense has become kind of come transformative at some point in time, and. Maybe Mario Cristobal just isn't going to give us that. Maybe he wants that defensive Oregon team. Uh, it, it's frustrating, man. I, I'm right there with you. All right, John, go ahead and give us your fallers. I'm not sure if this is because of my expectations and they have just not been met, let alone exceeded. But I was very excited about Tank Bigsby this year at Auburn. I thought he was just going to smash. Like I was thinking, looking at a 1500 yard season, it just not, it has not happened at Auburn. Now we don't get news in college football. So I've heard snippets. He might be a little injured, whatever. He does not look like the same back as he did last year as a freshman. What concerns me most is a freshman, Jarquez Hunter, is getting more carries. He's more productive. <coughs> the young man, Hunter, is averaging 8.6 yards a carry. Now, obviously, in limited carries, smaller sample size. But obviously, if, the, if Hunter could do it, why is Bigsby not doing it? I'm very down on him. He slipped. I'm not as impressed. Now, I'm open-minded, and I know the skill set. We saw it last year. But you know what? I got to move him down a little bit. I'm real I I can't say I'm overly impressed by any stretch of the imagination. So I'm moving Tank Bigsby down my rankings in Devi. And I I wonder this is like I can't even believe I'm saying it. As Keaton Slovis got himself undrafted? Like I'm just starting to wonder like he, you're looking at now in my book a day 3 fifth, fourth round pick right now? I mean, we, we were just talking on our other show about the freshman quarterback. Will he play? What does USC wants want to do? Slovis has looked bad. I mean, think about how good Drake London is. <clears throat> it makes me think that Slovis is even worse. I mean, if he didn't have Drake London, how bad would they be playing at USC? So I'm shocked at the fall. Now, I didn't think he was going to be a first-round pick or anything like that, but he's just fallen a ton. I mean, not as much as Spencer Rattler. He still has a job right now, and he hasn't been booed by the fan, at least to my knowledge. He hasn't been booed for Caleb Williams like Rattler did against Texas. But, man, Slovis has fallen far. All right, gentlemen, let's go ahead and let's preview the Week 8 college football slate specifically for Devi value. Now, this is an interesting one, gentlemen. I picked out the top six. I try to get a little bit of everything here when I pick out the Devi slate, all right? I want some group of five. I want some early game action. I want some late day action. And we're going to start here uh, with John. He's going to give us number six here. South Alabama at ULM. 
It doesn't sound like the sexiest matchup in the world. It's 7 o'clock ESPN 3, but John, especially for South Alabama, that's kind of why I highlighted this. There is Devi potential on the field, and we don't always get to see South Alabama play. Yeah, so first I want to give props to Louisiana Monroe, who upset Liberty. It was, I think the stat is like the only the second time or third time in 10 years at a 30 point underdog one. I mean, it was just like a crazy stat. No one had you Louisiana Monroe. I, I didn't even consider it, you know, against Liberty. So give it to them, but there's not really anyone on the um, Louisiana Monroe team, but Matt's alluding to, I think a very interesting, I think a second round grade, I do like this young man, wide receiver Jalen Tolbert of the South Alabama Jaguars. If you have not seen him, I would recommend you either record or watch this game. South Alabama has Jake Bentley, the former South Carolina quarterback. who You know, he's been in college football since 2016. I think him and Derek King are going for the longest time. Oh, my goodness, dude. It's like Jake Bentley – you know, you, you you think he's gone, and then you go to preview the South Alabama game, and you're like, dang it, that's right, Jake Bentley. Get out of he's my back, head. He's back in the game. So I will say at least Jake Bentley's smart enough to get the ball into Jalen Tolbert's hands. But Tolbert has size. He can separate. He has speed. I think he's a Y receiver. I'm not sure if he's a true X coming from the group of five. He's definitely got draft stock. There are teams interested in him. Scouts are talking about him. He's had some huge games. Five for 168. Six for 143. Last week against Georgia Southern, 11 for 174. He's only scored two touchdowns that this year, but that's the program. That's the offensive scheme. If you really do, if you're looking for that deep, NFL draft prospect, group of five. Jalen Tolbert is the guy I like out there, wide receiver. You really should watch him. It is on ESPN3. So if you have a DVR or if you have a way to watch it online, go ahead and watch Tolbert this week. He's a legitimate NFL prospect, folks. All right. And personally, I am going to record that game. Actually, that's not true because I'll probably have the three screens set up. So South Alabama, ah. ULM, that's going to be on the third screen. Uh, on the Or I should say on the second screen because on the first screen, it's going to be Nevada at Fresno State. And, yes, I am jacked up about Nevada at Fresno State. There's a ton of Divi talent in this game. Carson <laughs> Strong. Uh, I still think Carson Strong has a great shot of being a first-round NFL draft pick, especially as the as folks drop out of the quarterback class here. We talked about it. Keaton Slovis, no longer projected day one. Uh, Spencer Rattler, probably not going in the 22 draft, right? And so uh, Carson Strong continues just by his consistent performance, 16 touchdowns of three interceptions, 1,990 yards, a big arm. I enjoy his deep field accuracy. Now, he's a pocket passer, which in today's NFL brings you down just a notch, but absolutely going to be excited to watch Carson Strong against a good Fresno State team. It's one of the better teams that Nevada is going to face on their schedule, but it's not just Carson Strong. Two players you have to watch him throwing the ball to, and the first is going to be Cole Turner, the tight end. I think we're looking at a potential day two tight end here, leading the team with 34 receptions, leading the team with 403 yards, uh, tied for leading the team with four receiving touchdowns. I think Turner is an athletic uh, two-way tight end that's going to be very helpful here for the Wolfpack. And, of course, also on the Wolfpack roster is Romeo Dubs, another guy who is absolutely of interest to watch here for the Devi landscape. You flip to the other side of the ball, Jalen Cropper, I see him as an absolute NFL talent. He has a good shot of being a top 100 pick. 48 receptions, 546 yards, 10 touchdowns. Dangerous with the ball, or dangerous with his hands. Uh, are dangerous catching the ball, dangerous with the ball after the catch. Good hands for Jalen Cropper. Fast, athletic. Keep an eye on the running back, Ronnie Rivers. Not going to test the best. 
Not going to be the sexiest guy, but I see him as a late day three, potentially preferred UDFA type guy going into this. He's another guy who's been in college quite a while. And then uh, rising up later uh, onto the landscape here, a guy to keep your eye on is the quarterback, Jake Hayner, as well. Some solid potential Debbie value there building with uh, Hayner. So uh, for for Nevada, Fresno State, it's 7 o'clock on Fox Sports 2. A ton of Debbie talent here. All right. And going to kick it on over to Skip here to preview our number four top game on the slate, which is Oklahoma at Kansas. That is, I I don't think it's technically the big noon kickoff because it's on ESPN. It's 12 o'clock. I think big noon kickoff has to be on Fox, though. But Oklahoma at Kansas. Yeah, you know, on the Kansas side, there's not a ton to watch, but I still really like true freshman Devin Neal at running back. He hasn't had the the exciting stats that you're looking for, but, you know, you can watch him just more for the traits. 300 yards on 69 carries, a couple of touchdowns. He, he basically, he didn't win the job outright, but he's gotten enough run where I think he he's worth watching. And he's, in my opinion, the only guy in that on that Kansas side that I'm paying attention to. <laughs> Oklahoma is a whole nother ball game. Lots of guys over here. We already talked about the guy that we're not watching, and that's Spencer Rattler. Although I'm sure the cameras will show him on the bench if he's even there. But the new quarterback, true freshman Caleb Williams, five star, and he has absolutely exploded onto the scene. He's grabbed that job, and he's not letting it go. Williams looks fantastic, so you're going to want to watch him. But there's more on the Oklahoma side to pay attention to. They've got a decent tight end who I think is going to get some draft capital. I'm not sure where. I'm done predicting where tight ends go unless they're (laughs) absolute studs because it is a crapshoot when it comes to those traits transferring to the NFL. But Austin Sogner is a guy that is an intriguing prospect. So, you know, four stars. I like him. I think he's going to get draft capital. I just, I don't know if it's going to be late day two or, or into day three, not really sure where that's going to happen. Maybe early day two. I don't know. And running back, everybody was really high on Eric gray. And I'm pretty sure Matt, you're one of those guys, but I'm not seeing it. Cause the best running back that whenever I watch Oklahoma is Kennedy Brooks. I don't know if either one of these guys is going to translate to the NFL, but they are worth watching. Brooks is definitely the guy that's looking the best in that offense. And from a wide receiver perspective, there's a whole lot of goodness. The big one seems to be Jadon Hazelwood, at least recently is really stepping up. He's been one of those top guys. He's a five-star recruit, but then you've got Mario Williams, the true freshman. You got Marvin Mims, last year's freshman. Mike Woods is a guy that not a lot of people talk about, but he is an intriguing prospect too. I mean, that's four wide receivers right there to pay attention to. They're all getting time. So a, a ton to watch on the Oklahoma side of the ball. All right. Uh, John basically previewed this game earlier, but uh, number three on the slate here, Clemson at Pitt, 3.30 p.m. ESPN. I mean, guys, who preseason, who would have believed that Clemson at Pitt was a barn burner? But uh, I think we're going to have one here. I, I still am in shock of how bad DJ is actually playing. His accuracy, he's so inaccurate and undecisive with the football. I'm shocked. I mean, I I went back to watch the game recently, Notre Dame last year. He looked so good. I was like, did I miss watch? Did I not understand something? Like, uh, it's almost like bizarro world that he played so well in that game. But he's just been absolutely terrible. I mean, he doesn't even look like a legitimate quarterback prospect. Now, the only running back I wish we could see, Will Shipley, the freshman. I don't think he's going to play in this game reading. Doesn't look like it. I don't think Kobe Pace is an NFL running back. I don't think they have anyone other than Shipley who can really move the football on the ground. So there's nothing there for me. And I just got to say something. For years, I've loved Clemson wide receivers. But you know what? They need to recruit some speed. You can't just have six foot three, 215 pound middle of the zone wide receivers with big bodies. 
you need someone to take the top off the defense. They don't have a legitimate speedster. Now, I don't know if DJ could get him the ball, but at least the safeties would have to stay back a little bit. I don't think Nagata, he doesn't look like an NFL prospect right now. I've been watching him. You talk about separation, Matt. Nagata ain't got none of it. There's no separation. Now, Justin Ross, never won with separation. That was never his game. Same thing with T. Higgins. I mean, T. Higgins never won with separation. Justin Ross won in other ways. It's very hard for me to get a gauge on him because DJ's playing so bad. There are times where I've seen Justin Ross open and he can't get the football. I mean, it's just so he's going to be an interesting. I think he's going to fall pretty deep. You got the injury concern. You got lack of production. It hasn't gone well, unfortunately, for the young. It looks like he's healthy, so I'm very happy for the young man. But the film and the production isn't pretty. I think he's fallen pretty far. I do think he'll get drafted. But I think he's going to end up as like a maybe a third or fourth round pick where it might be a bargain somewhere. But I'll be looking at that game for a lot of different reasons. Now, Pittsburgh, I talked about Pickett, so I'm not going to talk about Pickett again. But you do need to watch Jordan Addison, the wide receiver. He's a sophomore. He had a very, very good freshman year. 666 yards on 60 receptions and four receptions. He smashed this year. 34 receptions, 586 yards, and nine touchdowns. Jordan Addison is one of those players who we talked about him a little bit last summer on the Debbie. He was in people's Debbie ranks. But Jordan Addison is someone you need to get some eyeballs in. He's a legitimate NFL prospect at wide receiver. All right, Oklahoma State at Iowa State, 3.30 p.m. on Fox. It's not the sexiest game in terms of scoring, but I'm going to be looking at the two running backs in this game. I think, you know, Jalen Warren has played his way into being a legitimate Debbie prospect for me. Watching him last week against Texas looked clean running in between the tackles. It looked like I saw some good lateral movement now. It's always better for me to evaluate these things on the uh, tape watching afterwards as opposed to watching live, but I saw some good lateral movement. Powerful runner on the season, 148 attempts for 705 yards and six touchdowns. Can he put that together against a solid Iowa State defense? And, of course, on the other side of the ball, the running back is going to be Brees Hall. A lot of folks are banging the round one Brees Hall drum. I don't think we're in that territory. He's always been a high production guy, but his tape has fallen short for me fairly consistently. I think he's a good back. I just don't see him being uh, an elite back, but he certainly has another opportunity to prove me wrong here against a really good Oklahoma State defensive unit. Of course, on the season, 748 yards and 10 touchdowns. Also keep an eye on Charlie Kohler, the tight end for Iowa State. 21 receptions, 279 uh, uh, 279 yards, and two touchdowns. Kohler is NFL bound. I think we're looking at somewhere in day uh, early, day three, uh, potentially late day two territory. And that leaves one game left on the slate. Ole Miss at LSU, 3.30 p.m. It's the SEC CBS game of the week. Skip, break it down for us. Yeah, it's the game of the week. Unfortunately, it's the game of guys that I would love to see that probably aren't playing or definitely aren't playing. <laughs> we'll start with Ole Miss, and it's quarterback Matt Corral, who could be the number one quarterback taken in the draft, and he is pretty much not ruled out officially, but it sure sounds like he's not going to be able to play. So that is really unfortunate for those of you Devi managers out there that want to watch Matt Corral. Jerry on Ely at running back is a guy that people have been high on. He's a little guy. He's not a guy that I'm super high on. I just don't, I don't like his all around game enough. I think he's exciting for college. I don't know if it's going to translate enough to the NFL to make it a real good fantasy asset for you. Of course, if he ends up in the right system, you know, in the right opportunity, maybe, but other than that, uh, not much of a fan there. Snoop Connor is just a, a running back that pounds it in. He's not, a Debbie guy, in my opinion, but you guys can tell me if you think I'm wrong. Of course, 
Over on the LSU side, again, going to start with the guys that aren't playing. Some people's number one overall Debbie wide receiver, Kayshawn Butte, unfortunately hurt, so he can't play. Big time bummer. One of my loves in the incoming freshman class, Chris Hilton, also out. He's not playing. Big time bummer. I'm not sure how much he would have gotten as far as time, but I really did like him coming in. There's other guys to look at there. Another freshman, Deion Smith and Armani Goodwin at running back, as well as Brian Thomas Jr. wide receiver, Corey Kiner at running back. Unfortunately, those running backs are probably going to play major second fiddle to Tyron Davis Price, who came out of nowhere for, I think, 287 yards last week against Florida. So probably won't get to see a lot of those freshmen, but Davis Price is interesting. He's got some traits that... Who knows if he can make a large push at the end of the season, maybe he can get himself drafted, you know, early day three. I'm not sure, but it's at least worth watching. And then I'll finish it off with Max Johnson, the quarterback at LSU. Some people are quite high on him. I think he's a, a late day two, day three guy. I just, I don't see the arm and I think he's going to, he's not going to impress the NFL scouts enough to, to get him the draft capital that you're going to like. And I just, I feel like he's going to end up being one of those quarterbacks that everybody, you know, liked him in college. And then he just keeps falling on draft day. But that's just, that's just what I feel about Johnson. All right. There you have it. Our week eight slate preview risers and fallers news and notes. Gentlemen, it is so good to be back here on the Debbie seminar. It is so good uh, to be talking college football, getting ready for another great Week 8 slate. And I'm sure after this weekend, there's going to be even more movement here in the Devi ranks. So I look forward to circling back next week and uh, talking about the results of Week 8. As always, we appreciate you listening.